Here is the water pouring out of the famous Wookiee hole near Wells. The main problem is, where exactly does it come from? And do the water-filled passages finally stop the cable explorer? Are they the final frontier? In this program at Wookiee Hole, we'll find out the answer. This water comes through a narrow passage from the well-known lake inside. Here we are, floating deep underground in this placid lake in the heart of the famous Wookiee Hole. Well, in actual fact, this is the River Axe, and there's quite a, a strong current flowing down here. The water drains through from the top of Mendip from Swildon, the very water we were paddling in a few days ago, and finds its way down to join the River Axe. So there is a, a connection between the two caves, and this has been proven by floor testing and dye testing methods, but as yet, there isn't a physical connection. So there's a group of people, a group of very dedicated, rather specialized people, who are trying to make this physical connection between the two. Uh, these are the cave diving group. And with a bit of luck, we'll be meeting a couple of them in a minute, and I hope they'll tell us all about it. But they are a race apart, uh, as you'll shortly see. I look down. Below me was the weird world of the underwater divers, as they worked through cracks as narrow as those I'd seen in Swildon. But what a difference! These cracks were water-filled to the roof, a world of dangerous, bubbling semi-silence, and silt floating up to make a brown fog in the narrowest part. came ashore to meet the cave divers. That's your on Parker, plumber. That's yeah, that's and Adrian Wilkins. Adrian Tyler. Wilkins, research student. And, and Aldwin Excellent. Cooper, also research student. But they're all kitted up. Uh, now's our chance to have a look at their kitting close to order, as it were. Can one of you stand up? Yeah, sure. Well, the equipment is basically that of the caver, which is a wetsuit to keep out the cold. Uh, in addition, we have a, a neoprene hood which pulls up over the, the head, like this. Um, also, of course, we have to have uh, gear for breathing underwater. Uh, this is the air bottle, which contains enough air to breathe for about 45 minutes or so. We have lighting, which attaches to the waist, uh, and about 20 pounds of lead weights, in my case, to compensate for buoyancy. Uh, then there are the other items, uh, the face mask, which fits over like this, so that we can see underwater. I also have a diving knife uh, for cutting lines underwater should I get entangled in them. Uh, my friend here also has a depth gauge uh, which tells us how deep we are at any one moment. Uh, this is essential for decompression if, if this is necessary. Well, gentlemen, don't let me hold you up. The river axe is all yours. Thank you. Frankly, I felt rather moved watching these young men. They were kitting themselves up rather like medieval knights with armor before battle. They probably laugh at this, but they were certainly going to face danger as soon as they submerged below those dark waters. They signaled to each other to say everything is okay. Then they are ready to go. They squeeze into cracks you'd think twice about, even if you met them in ordinary caving. But here they are in dark tubes of water known as siphons. No hope of surfacing if there's trouble. Thank you. 
With relief, they come up into an air-filled cave where they could breathe normally if they wanted to. They give the signal, all's well, and remove mouthpieces. They take every chance to save air. The bottle only gives 40 minutes supply. Across the cavern now to the next water-filled siphon. The sequence is siphon, then cave, then siphon again. In Wookie, this sequence runs for one and a half miles. Nobody dives alone in a cave like this. There's always a support party on shore. And I talked to the leader of the team, John Parker, who's recognized as perhaps being one of the best cave divers anywhere. John, you've done as much diving as anybody. What's it really like down there? Mostly it's black. Black rock walls or mud banks grow. And you stir the mud up and you, you can see nothing. But sometimes it's pretty. And how do you find your way about? Oh, it's uh, quite easily. Plenty of light there, no lamps, no trouble at all. And when we dive, we use a line, put a shot line down with a lead weight on it, dive vertical or something, and then just follow the line down. If you lose the line and you can't find your way back, what then? There's no second chance. The visibility is usually about absolutely nil. Do you do it for recreation, just for the challenge, or is there some scientific thought behind it? Oh, I think we probably do it for science's sake, just to find things geological formation, archaeological stuff, anything like that. But geologically, there's all different forms of sumps. Some are muddy, some are clean, rock tubes, jagged. There are all sorts, boulders, sand, gravel. The funny macro are sort of way they're beautiful. Uh, I think the most exciting thing of it is when we break through the other side of the sump and we'll find something new that no one's ever trodden before. How dangerous is it down there? extremely dangerous. Why do you really do it? I don't know really. It must be mad. But I think I've learned to understand. It's the thrill of exploration and of testing yourself to the limit. Here's the public come. They call it the witch's parlor. It's 130 feet wide. 12 foot high all over, and above us there are 500 feet of rock and no visible support. It's a most remarkable, wide, almost self-supporting chamber. And in the background, the boys are getting ready for the preliminaries of the long dive. It's rather like an assault on part of Everest. You've got to lay surprise far ahead before you make the actual final attempt. And that will be as far as anybody has gone yet into the uttermost recesses of Wookiee Hole. train, as it were, for the big adventure tomorrow. In the meantime, John and Colin have laid out a little display for us here. On the far side with John, there's the suit that he's going to wear when he tries to get to the furthest length of Wookiee Girl hole. And next to him, that's a modern suit, of course, is the suit by Colin, which dates back a mere 20 years. But what a contrast. It really does look brilliant. How did you get into it? Well, the diver gets in the front here. He wears all his warm clothes to keep out the cold water and he ties it up after it's neatly and clamps it together. Near his winter woolies underneath. Oh, yeah, to keep him warm. That's what keep him, keeps him warm. And breathing? There's the oxygen cylinder, which goes into a breathing bag on a harness. 
sodaline canister and his mask to see with and the mouthpiece there. They must have been very brave men indeed to use this sort of thing. Oh indeed, it's very, very cumbersome and you can't, then you must walk everywhere. Well, I'd rather lose the modern gear that John's using tomorrow, so would I. Well, here's the modern suit, John, that you'll be wearing tomorrow. Now, what are the plans? Well, the plan for tomorrow, the three of us will enter this sump and film from here to Wookiee 9, which is 250 feet. We hope that the third diver will be sure to bring bottles here to assist us. We then go on from Wookiee 9, underwater, to about 75 feet depth, and on up to Wookiee 20, which is about 1,000 feet in all from here. And then we have more bottles then to back us up by the assistance of the other diver, and we carry on then to 22, which is a total distance underwater of about a quarter of a mile and reaches a total depth of about 100 feet. We then will try to film one of the divers trying to push through a boulder collapse at the end, where we hope to find the way on and make a breakthrough. So far, that boulder collapse has stopped you going any further. Yes, it stopped us for about 12 months now. We've had about 10 dives and found no way on. Next morning, Adrian, Aldwin and John made their final meticulous check. Can you see you giving it? container of compressed air has to be carefully checked. A faulty valve could impel the whole expedition. Mm, it's up to 190. 160. Do a bit more. The boys are all getting ready to go to see how far they can penetrate in the vast system that lies beyond. And by the way, Aldwin and John are carrying the extra equipment, lighting and the camera, an additional burden for them, but about which they seem quite happy. Cooper tells us what happened. Well, everything went wrong from the start. We got through about as far as nine without too much trouble. And then uh, John and Adrian dived down to go around the closest loop to film the new stuff. I was following down with the light and I couldn't clear my ears at all. So I had to go back into 9-1, try a few times to clear my ears. But by the time I eventually got down to them, the visibility was almost down to zero. And Adrian couldn't find the new passages. and. Uh, we just had to give up at that point and go around through to 9-2. We thought we'd carry on filming down to 20 because the visibility there would be good. But we started off down the line, filming as we went. It's slow work with that camera and the light and getting everything in perspective. We got down to about 13, 14, the junction between the deep route to 20 and the shallow route to 20. And we decided we'd film up the pothole on the shallow route. Adrian and John went ahead. I started through and somehow I felt very dizzy, very sick. I couldn't orient myself in the cave at all and I got completely entangled in the lines. It took me a good five minutes to get back out of them, by which time again the visibility was so stirred up I couldn't even see the other divers. While I was trapped in the line, of course the others were trapped on the far side of me. So that if I'd become really entangled in the line and had been really ill at that point, they were trapped beyond me and would have had great difficulty getting back. They were using up their air supplies very fast. In fact, John completely ran through one bottle, which means that he was down below his 100% safety margin, which is it's very lucky we were carrying two bottles each on that trip. Uh, if I'd been particularly ill and I'd been desperate, I'd been running out of air, I'd never have expected them to come back for me. Because if they'd tried to rescue me in any way, it's likely that they'd have got themselves into trouble. I'd have panicked, I'd have grabbed onto them, I'd have tried to take their air. You tend to lose your rational, rational analysis of things when you're in that situation. John and I had a 
terrible amount of trouble communicating with each other. We had to try to use hand signals, which we could hardly see. We tried shouting at each other by taking mouthfuls of air and trying to shout down each other's ears. We couldn't really make ourselves understood. So, in the end, I just pointed that we'd carry on diving. I'd recovered. We made about another hundred feet to the base of the pothole. We started swimming up that, filming. When I started to feel sick again, I started to feel dizzy. This time, I, I decided I just couldn't go on. I was risking things too much. So I turned around and went back after turning the others. I made it back to nine, two, without very much trouble, but I was using a terrific amount of air. And I got to nine, two, and I sat there for about a quarter of an hour, waiting for the others to come back. I just sat there recovering. We talked about it and decided that since the dive seemed generally jinxed, we'd give it up, we'd come back. Since I felt ill, it was decided I'd go through first, carrying the lights, and John Park would follow me fairly closely behind in case anything went wrong. I got about 150 feet around Cozy's Loop, then about 50 feet of the end, and uh, I vomited, spewed into my gag. It's one of the nastiest things that's ever happened to me. It means that when you vomit, you lose your air as well, and you have to take the gag out, you have to clean it, you have to wash your mouth out, and make sure you get some air before you black out. <clears throat> On the way back from there, after I recovered for a few minutes underwater, made sure everything was okay, my light started to fade, and I just made it back to here without, before the light faded completely. Never had anything like that happen before. Certainly the worst thing that's happened. Others have been close, but that's the closest ever. Still, it won't stop me diving again. This is the sort of thing you expect to happen now and again, but you just hope it doesn't happen too often. If I'd carried on vomiting, that would have been it. I wouldn't have made it. The whole part of your training is that you are reliant on yourself. You're reliant on your equipment, of course, to some degree, but in the final analysis, it's you. You must keep your head, you must work your own way out of a bad situation, and you mustn't expect anybody else to come in after you. You choose to take up a dangerous sport, you've got to accept the consequences. So we never made the breakthrough at Wookie Hole. Foolhardy? Some people may say so, but not I. These are the men who are pushing back the frontiers in the adventure of caving. I salute them. Without their skill, I would never have seen the underground marvels of the secret menus. Well, this is the end of the road. The river Axe pouring out from the vast cavern of Wookie Hole. The Axe is the river whose previous watercourses and its tributaries form most of the caves that I've been exploring. And I was very glad indeed that I went underground to see what the men did had to hold. Of course, I went with the experts. Because what little I've seen to it, caving is no place for the novice. You've really got to know what you're doing. So if you decide to do this, don't forget, get in touch with a competent caving club. And above all, don't go on your own back. Go with the experts. And then I think you two will be delighted that you've had a chance to go down and see the strange and ancient underworld of the Mendip Hills.